much of the mechanisms in medicine is not well understood. In fact, we still don't understand why anesthesia works. We know it works, but we don't know why. We have no idea. Next slide, please. Copper. Okay, now we're getting into trace minerals. Copper and zinc uh, work together in the body. Um, copper is involved in the formation of red blood cells that help carry oxygen in the body and the bloodstream. Um, you need a certain amount of copper in your diet. There is a recommended daily allowance. We don't recommend exceeding that because too much copper can build up and can become toxic. Copper and zinc compete with each other, but they also work with each other in the body. Next slide, please. Um, let's talk about zinc for a second. Zinc works with copper, as I said that. It can compete with copper. The chelated forms are best. You'll see amino acid, chelate, uh, monomethionine. You'll see that a lot um, for zinc, for copper. Those are the best forms to take it in. Zinc, let's go to the next slide. Um, zinc, just briefly, zinc is involved with the production of stomach acid, production of tears and saliva. If you don't have enough zinc, you'll start to lose your sense of smell, your sense of taste. Zinc is involved all over the body. It's a very reactive metal in its, in its metal form in the laboratory. And in the body, it has a number of functions that are all very important. Zinc supplementation, you wind up putting people on zinc all the time. Um, an awful lot of, um, an awful lot of, uh, of, of acid reflux is the result of zinc deficiency and not being able to produce enough stomach acid. Um, so let's move on to manganese. Um, manganese is involved with the breakdown of fats and proteins and the metabolism of amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins in the body. Um, and it's involved with the metabolism of other vitamins. Manganese is also best as a chelated manganese. Next slide, please. Selenium. Selenium is involved, remember I said glutathione? A little while ago, we were talking about the antioxidant regeneration. And glutathione is the body's most powerful antioxidant that it makes naturally. Selenium is involved with the production of glutathione. Um, so it is incredibly important to get enough selenium in your diet. Um, and certain parts of the country, here we don't have to worry about it so much, but certain parts of the country, particularly in the Midwest, the soil is very depleted of selenium. And so food tends to be quite depleted of selenium. And so things that come to us from the Midwest, like corn and soybeans, tend to be quite depleted in selenium. So often it's important to supplement with selenium. Uh, it's recommended not to take more than the recommended daily allowance of selenium, because selenium and sulfur are very closely related. And if you take too much selenium, your body will use it in place of sulfur. And if sul sulfur is what's responsible for body odor. And if you have too much selenium, your body odor will be magnified by about 100 times. People won't want to be near you. So selenium chemists are very unpopular people. <laughs> um, if you're going to take selenium, we recommend you take selenomethionine or selenocysteine. These are amino acid forms of the of selenium that are best absorbed. Avoid sodium selenate and selenite. These don't get absorbed at all. Next slide, please. Um, and there, there's two others that I wanted to just talk about briefly. Is iodine and, and chromium. Um, iodine is used by the thyroid gland. It regulates the body's metabolism. If your um, metabolism is too slow, you tend to gain weight. Your, your hair becomes thicker and coarser. Um, you um, have less energy. Um, if you're, um, that tends to, we don't, we don't tend to see a whole lot of hypothyroid as a result of iodine deficiency near the coast because we get it from kelp, from seaweed, from fish products. People who live in the Midwest, there's something called the goiter belt. It's because they don't get enough iodine in their diets. That's why the government decided that we needed to put iodine in table salt so people would get enough of it. And so some people even managed to not get enough of it from table salt. So um, in this area, it's not super critical. Um, but uh, some people do need more iodine. And we recommend the best forms come from kelp, uh, kelp uh, extract. Yes? If you are having problems with your thyroid, what would you recommend? It depends on what the problem is. If you're hyperthyroid, you're hyper, if your thyroid is too active, taking iodine can actually be bad for you. If your thyroid is underactive, taking iodine could help. It could make it worse. It, it's, the thyroid is kind of a complicated system, and that's something that's best addressed individually by your healthcare provider. Um, the, uh, okay. 
chromium. Chromium is usually available as chromium picolinate. Um, iodine and chromium are not in my brochure that I handed out. Um, the chromium I probably should put in there. Uh, but chromium, it, it, if you supplement with chromium um, for diabetics particularly, it helps with blood sugar regulation. Um, chromium is involved with a number of biochemical functions in the body, but the thing it's best known for is blood sugar regulation. Next slide. Okay, so we're close to the end. The big list to avoid. Carbonates. Tablets are still sitting there. They're kind of sort of reacting. They're still sitting there, putrefying in your stomach, giving you stomach cancer. Don't take carbonates. Um, oxide forms. Oxides are quite difficult to absorb, um, and they're usually the cheapest and least absorbable forms of the thing. Vitamin C without anything else. So vitamin C is best taken, as I said, as a whole food supplement that has its cofactors, rutin, hesperidin, and bioflavonoids. Those are, that, that piece of information is in my brochure. Um, that's the best way to get it, and the, the cofactors that you take it with help to use it better and help promote its, uh, its antioxidant functions. Yes? Now, I've seen that you buy at drug stores um, vitamin C pills that are just capsules full of like super dosages in them. Yes. Is basically safe to say they're worthless? No, they, they do serve a function. Of vitamin C to um, what we call bowel tolerance, which I don't recommend that you do this unless your healthcare provider instructs you on how to do this, because some people this can potentially promote kidney stones in some people. So uh, you have to watch out from too much, too like mega doses of vitamin C orally for people who are predisposed to kidney stones. But um, uh, vitamin C by itself in super high doses. Is an, is an antihistamine, so it's quite effective uh, in, during allergy season. Um, and and uh, vitamin C has been, uh, Linus Pauling actually studied vitamin C in super, super high doses, particularly intravenous vitamin C, where you can get amazingly high doses, because there's a limit to how much you can absorb orally. It's limited to about 500 milligrams every six hours. You can increase that a little bit by taking large doses consistently, but you'll wind up giving yourself diarrhea if you take too much. Yeah. Um, Over-the-counter vitamin D supplements, especially the cheaper ones, uh, because the concentration could be way off. You might be taking a vitamin D supplement and think you're getting a particular dosage and not getting anything close to the dosage. So it's important if you're going to take vitamin D, to take vitamin D or to take it for a specific purpose to get a professional supplement that we know exactly how much is in there. Um, vitamin A during pregnancy, unless you're taking the beta carotene form, we just recommend that most people take beta carotene because it's just safer. It's uh, harder to, uh, to develop toxicity. Iron supplements, men under, men under 65 should not take iron unless their doctor tells them to. Um, women, Used, women help supplement with iron to prevent anemia. Um, uh, vitamin K, if you're taking a blood thinner, vitamin K, you should absolutely avoid unless you're directed otherwise by your doctor. Next slide. <coughs> what should you get then? Because there's this whole list of things that are worthless. What should we take? Calcium citrate, that's the best form of calcium. Magnesium aspartate or malate. Iron, if you're going to take it. And fumarate. Um, copper, zinc, and mang manganese chelates will sometimes be called amino acid chelates. Sometimes you'll see it as monomethionine. Selenium as selenomethionine or selenocysteine. Uh, B12 as methylcobalamin or hydroxycobalamin. Um, cyanocobalamin, as I say, is all right. But as we get older, it becomes more difficult to absorb vitamin B12 from oral intake. And so it's best to take the methyl or hydroxyl forms of it. And vitamin C, if you're going to take it, you should take it with root and spirit and bioflavonoids. The things that are found with it naturally in foods and food products. Um, we see the root and spirit and bioflavonoids in citrus and kiwi and kale, and particularly acerola berries and rose hips, in which it has the absolute highest concentration of any fruit. 
Next slide, please. What was the other one, grow sticks? Grow sticks are acerola berries. Acerola. Mm -hmm. You, you'll sometimes see um, vitamin uh, C from rose hips or vitamin C from acerola. Mm -hmm. Those are the highest concentration of C and they have the cofactors that you need to really use it well. And any questions? 